At this time, we'd like to thank God for blessing all of us to be here with you on this occasion to worship God in spirit and in truth. I'd like to thank Terry and the elders and all of you for inviting us to come and be with you on this grand occasion in this summer series. My heart was made to rejoice to receive this invitation, and I do count it all joy to be here with you. I'm glad to see all Brother Lewis and old acquaintance of mine to a brother in the Lord. Glad to have him uh, to be here to encourage me on and his lovely wife as well. We want to thank again all of you for being here tonight, and we're going to be sharing a lesson that has already been given to you. And the lesson is, the one I know the one who holds tomorrow. To get this lesson to start it tonight, I'm going to be sharing us our attention from the Old Testament. And we're going to be taking our lesson focus. I will be reading out of the King James Version. The Bible says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succah about the from the fourth hour, rather, rather uh, 600,000 men on foot, and the Bible says, besides children. Verse number 38, and a mixed multitude also went up with them, and there were flocks and herds and very much cattle. And they held, baked unleavened cakes, and the Bible mentions they had dough and other things that were with them as they left Egypt. But the part I want to focus on is in verse number 40 and following, Telling me that the children and the people that learned left there, they had abode in that area for 430 years. Now, in that particular verse, in verse number 40, it tells us in a nutshell how long the children of Israel underwent distress in their lives. The Bible tells us quite emphatically that when they had been under this domain, under Egypt, that they were not on their own cognizance. In other words, they were governed by the rulership of Egypt itself, and the pharaohs at that time. Many people suppose in their lives when they go through the challenges in life that when they come in contact with a situation that is beyond their efforts of dealing with it, they says, how can I deal with this in an effective manner? Some of them would even say, I don't think there's any hope. But one thing I found out about man, when we're dealing with issues in life, we need to realize that there is always someone who can help us. But it all depends on our help. We cannot get deliverance from any situation in life if our helper, the one who is assisting us, does not have the capability to render the things that are needed and us to eliminate the problem in our lives. But we're going to be focusing tonight on one who holds tomorrow. If you notice one who holds tomorrow and knows what it's going to incur in life, you can depend on that person. You don't have to worry about anything. It all depends on the power of the person who holds tomorrow. Now, people have a challenge grappling with that because we have a problem in dealing with somebody he can even hold today. We have issues today. We say, who can I find to help me out today? Forget about tomorrow. But we're going to go beyond today and tomorrow and also in the future. And we're going to share with you tonight the one who holds tomorrow. That's the one I believe in. That's the one you believe in. That's the one all disciples of the Lord believes in, the one who holds tomorrow. I'm glad that we believe in that person rather than putting our trust in other people. Now, the children of Israel were in a dilemma. They were in a situation where they had not asked for. And we're going to share tonight how, we, how they responded and how he would respond to them as well. The Bible tells us quite emphatically that when they got in Egypt, but there was some history about how all of this happened. Now, somebody may say, well, what is the situation in their immediate area when they were in the land of Goshen that necessitated their being in this situation in the beginning? Well, let's take a, take a step back and look at how this all began. The background began in Ex Genesis, rather, chapter 4 to 6 through Exodus chapter 1. That is the history of the Israelites' background. As you may remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he brought Joseph and all those people from Genesis 46 and following. They brought that generation to the land of Egypt. We know the story of how Joseph became the ruler of that particular area and brought his father and their generation. About 75 people came with them. When Joseph, Jacob, and all that generation passed, when their kindred passed away, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 1 through 7 that they were prospering. But in verse 8, something, a twist comes. The Bible says there arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And that made all the difference. Instead of continually to be 
according to the children of Israel, what they did, they began to punish them. And then the oppression began. And Exodus chapter 12 is just a foreshadow, it's a, rather it's a future of what happened back then. What do you mean by that, Brother Gilmore? When the man that rose up that did not know Joseph, that began the torture in their lives. That began a situation in their lives that they weren't prepared to deal with. I want to ask you, what do you do when you come in contact with a situation in your life that you were not expecting? As people put it today, some people put it, they were blindsided. They did not say, I asked for this. It could be a health challenge. It could be a financial challenge. It could be a domestic challenge. How do you respond when you have all these challenges incurred in your life and you don't know what you're going to do? It all depends on the person that's trying to assist you to, hit you to, get, to help you rather to get from where you are right now to where you need to be in the future. We're going to look at a situation that was, that was considered impossible to overcome. Because when they were in Egypt, they were oppressed, and there was no form of deliverance anywhere. What do you do when you don't have any hope? I'll tell you what many people do. They hold, they hold up their hand and throw it up in frustration and says, there is no need to even try. Why? Because there is no help. There, I have nothing to look forward to. There's no one that can help me out of this situation. So they give up. What happens to a man who gives up? I'll tell you what happens. When a person has no hope, there is life is meaningless. There's no need to live on on a day-to-day -day basis. People say, what's the use? Why, put I gener why should I put my effort in it? Why should I generate any energy to try to do something what I know I'm not going to get any better? Do you know why people have a dilemma in when it comes to health challenges? I've seen people have a lot of health challenges in life, and they become morbid in their personality, and they say, well, there is no hope for me. They says, why well, I try. I've tried all the medication. The doctors told me there's no hope. There is no cure. So they give up. When a man has lost hope, here's the problem. You lose a desire to live. There's no meaning to life. When you don't have anybody to hope for that help you out of your situation, you give up. And life is purposeless. I want you to think about a generation of people who went through that ordeal not for one year, not for two years, not for 10 years, but for over 430 years. Can you not see the lifestyle that they have? It is a hopeless lifestyle. They didn't trust in anyone who could help them. Egypt at this time was a polytheistic nation. They believed in many gods, the sun god, the moon god. They believed in the crocodile and worshiped different gods. And none of the gods that the people could appeal to could save them and did save them. They assembly were in a hopeless situation. Now, fast forward to Exodus chapter 3. We have a situation where Moses is in the field working, doing his job. When Moses was in the field working in Exodus chapter 3, Moses had already left the land of Egypt. He fled and he stayed and got married. And now he was in the land working with his father-in-law and he has a wife and a family. When Moses left Egypt, he was 40. But in Exodus chapter 3, he's 80 years old. That's retirement age for most of us, is it not? Most of us says, I'm going to retire way before 80. But God says, I'm calling you out of retirement and you got to work for me. 80 years old, he began his venture with the Lord. The Lord told him what he had a job for him to do. I want you to deliver my people from captivity. Moses had the idea, so me, God had to work on him. You know the story. When he saw the burning bush, he knew something was different from that. He approached it, and God addressed him by saying, take off your shoes from your feet. The ground where you're standing is holy ground. You are in my presence now. God told him the job he had for him to deliver Egypt. Can you imagine uh, Moses says, well, me, I, I can't talk, I can't speak. He began to make all kinds of excuses. God had to work on the leader before he could lead his people out. God says, here's what I want you to do. What is in your hand? It's a rod. Throw it down. He threw it round. He said, well, you know what happened? It turned into a snake. He did what I would have done. He ran from it. God says, grab it, but grab it by the tail. It turned into a rod again. Put your hand in your bosom. He pulled it out. It was leprous. He said, put it back in. It was restored as it was before. 
God had to work on his leader to tell him there is hope. God says there is a tomorrow for you. There is a hope for tomorrow for the children of Israel, and you will do the leading of those particular people. Now let us see what the children of Israel were dealing with. All the plagues that Moses went to deal with the children of Israel and went before Pharaoh, Pharaoh hard in his heart and would not let them go. The last plague, as you know, is the plague of death in Exodus chapter 12. And when the children of Israel were going out of the land of Egypt, God called them. He says, we'll get them ready to leave the land of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. Now here is the challenge. The children of Israel lived in the land of Goshen, which was on the outskirts of the inner part of the country. How are you going to leave them out? Here comes the power of God to show Moses, I hold tomorrow. He says, I want you to gather all the people together. That's quite a chore. Now, I want to fast forward again to Exodus chapter 12 and verse, uh, chapter 12 and verse number 36 and following but it tells the number of people that left out from Egypt and what made the job so challenging. Notice I've got some calculations here. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 12 and 37, there were about 600,000 men on foot, notice this, besides women and children. Keep that figure in your mind. 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Let's do some calculations on how many Israelites there were. Women generally outnumber men three to one. I'm going to be liberal with that. If that's the case, there were three, if they outnumber men three to one, that's three times 600,000, that's 1.8 million ladies. 1.8 million females. Females had children. Let's be conservative. Let's say that only one child per a, a female of only 600,000, not the 1.8. So that means that the men plus the women plus the children, if we use a three to one ratio, that meant it was three million people that went out. That's a lot of people. But I'm gonna be conservative. I'm gonna give you a two to one ratio. 600,000 men, and there were 1,200, 1 1.2 million females. Only 600,000 of them had only one child, not two, one child. That would make the total of the total number of the children of Israelites that were leaving the area 2.4 million people. That's a lot of people, beloved. A lot of people. And to show you how many people there were, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever considered the population of the areas, the, the population of the people in this area? Well, you don't have to. I've done the homework for you. You ready for this? I looked at the census that was taken in 2021. In Palm Beach County, there were 1,498,000 people. St. Lucie County, 343,579,000. In Indian River County, 163, 662,000. Martin County, 159, 942,000. Okeechobee County, 40,266 people. That is a grand total of 2,205,449 people. In other words, there were more Israelites came out than there were in these five counties. I want you to picture that in your mind. Palm Beach County, St. Lucie County, Martin County, Indian River County, and Okeechobee County, all the people in the entire, those entire counties do not come up to the number of Israelites that left the land of Egypt. Now with that in mind, Moses had to gather the people together from the land of Goshen. How do you contact 2.4 million people? How do you do it? Well, he couldn't pick up his cell phone and say, listen here, fellas, we're getting ready to leave. He couldn't get on the internet. How do you contact? That is God in operation. That's the one who holds tomorrow. Only a God can let a man contact 2.4 million people. Notice this, not a month or six months to prepare in one night. 
because God gave the order to have the firstborn killed of, of, the, of each one that didn't have the blood of the lamb in, Gen, in, in Exodus chapter 12 at midnight. So from midnight to sometime after Pharaoh told them to leave, Moses had to contact all these people, organize them, have them to pack up and leave the land of Egypt. How long does it take them to do that? You will be hard-pressed, beloved. Get all those people, those counties that I mentioned from Palm Beach County, St. Lucie County, and all of the other counties I, I mentioned, get all of them together. How long does it take you to organize all those people in a couple of hours, even a couple of days or a couple of weeks, and have them to go anywhere? They got to pack up and just take everything they got, children, babies, and all, and leave. Take the livestock, everything, and leave. How long does it take you to gather those people? The only way you can accomplish that is one who controls tomorrow. That's the only way. I've seen situations here since I've moved to Florida. When hurricanes come, when they tell people to evacuate the area, it takes them some time. People have to start getting ready a couple of days ahead of time just to go from one place to the, another part of the section of Florida or go out of state. And that doesn't even come close to 2.4 million people. But here's one man got to organize with all these other people and have them to leave the land of Goshen. Now, when they get these people together, the Bible says now they are leaving. God told them where to go to expedite and fast forward to the future. When they left, the Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. The Egyptians says, hurry up and leave. We'll be dead people. They encouraged the people to leave. They packed up the children, even the livestock. How long does it take to gather all of your livestock? All your children, their babies, and all your belongings gather up and go in a single file. Let's look at those counties again. Take Martin County, Palm Beach County, Indian River, St. Louis, and all the counties that I mentioned, those five counties. Have them to get on Interstate 95 and go breath wide. How long will that parade law be? How long will it last? How long will it be? How long does it take all those people from the counties that I mentioned to travel 10 miles? How long? Only a God can do that. How long does it take them to tell them to go in a place where you won't see any wars, to avoid getting, being frightened and want to go back to the land of Egypt, which he did in chapter 13? How long does it take him to do that? Then he tells him to go at Exodus chapter 14. I like Exodus chapter 14. In verses 1 through 6, he tells them to go camp by Mount Pilaroth and Migdon and the sea, by the Red Sea. Now, remember, God is leading them there. God told Moses. Now, here's what God did not do. God didn't talk to Aaron, his brother. God didn't talk to any of the Israelites. He talked to man, one man, Moses. You tell the people where to go. You lead them, and I'm going to tell you to stay there. They went there by the Red Sea. You know the story. Verse number 10, Pharaoh changed his mind, and he says, I'm going after them. I'm fast-forwarding it. Verse number 10 of chapter 14 he says, I'm going after them, and we're going to bring them back. That's the, what Pharaoh had in his mind. But God says, not so. The children looked back and saw the children of Israel coming, and they became affright. They looked, they pointed their finger, Moses, you're responsible for this. Look what you did. It would have been better for us to die in, in Egypt than to come here. He said, it's all your fault. I'm paraphrasing here. Moses told them something quite clearly. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Egyptians that you see right now, you will never see them again. Now, here's what God did. If you look at Exodus chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, God let the children of Israel out by a cloud by day and a fire by night to show you his power. I want you to think about that. When the children of Israel got ready to camp out at night, if you were an enemy of the children of Israel, would you attack them at night? Most people say that's the best time to attack a group of people, right? That would be a challenge for the people who, if you were an enemy of the Israelites. Why? Can you imagine people approaching the children of Israel and wants to attack them at night? And then when they get close, the leader was tell his, say, wait a minute, fellas, we got a problem here. What's the matter? We can attack them. Look up there. And in the sky, a big ball of fire suspended in midair. That's the way God led them at night. And it is up there suspended. 
fire is not suspended in the sky in midnight, in midair. That was the representation of God. Would you dare attack them? I think not. God says, I control this situation. And in the daytime, he led them by a pillar of cloud. But what happened when Pharaoh and his army were approaching them, here's where the challenge come with people. They became frightened, like I said, in chapter 14, verses 12 and following. Moses, God told Moses, hold out your rod over the sea. We know the story. Here's one thing that really amuses me every time I meditate on this particular story. When Moses held out his rod over the sea and God caused the wind to pass over it that night, and many people don't even consider this, the children of Israel went through that land on dry ground. Now, I hear many people, of have, I have some friends, rather, that ask me about this story of Moses and the Red Sea, and they always tell me about Charleston, Heston, and Moses. Some of you may have seen that story, you know, the party of the Red Sea. But, you know, that's television, I tell them. That's not the way it really happened. <laughs> because they had all the animation in that movie with Charleston Heston going through there, and he was trying to save the Israelites. I said, first of all, the crossing of the Red Sea happened at night, number one. And the people were not running and pushing each other in a frantic manner trying to get away from Pharaoh, number two. What they forget is that that cloud that went before them, before Pharaoh got so close to Moses, the Bible tells me that cloud that, got, that represented God left the children of Israel from the front of them, went behind them, and got between them and the Egyptians. That neither one of them could go toward each other all night long. And God let it stay there. He let his children go across the Red Sea, and they started leaving. And then when God got ready, the one who holds tomorrow, lifted that cloud up. Now, here's another thing about Pharaoh that, ceases, that, that, that I'm always amused. I don't care whether it's at night or day. It seems to me that when he got down to the Red Sea and saw the water had parted, something should have said, wait a minute, this is not normal. Water does not part itself. To give you an idea, suppose you leave here tonight and go out there to the river, to the intracoastal, to the water, and all of a sudden you see the water is parted. Would you go across? I don't think so. I wouldn't dare go across. If any of you have enough faith to go across, I'll let you go first and I'll watch and see what happens. But the Pharaoh didn't even stop and think, this is not normal. Water does not part it. This is the Red Sea. And he took off after them. We know the story. Now, here's what God did not do. God says, I'm going to kill you. I'm not going to let you follow after them. I'm not going to let you harm them at all. He didn't do that. I'm stressing that point to say this. There are a lot of things God is not going to do because he is God. God could have stopped Pharaoh. God could have killed Pharaoh. God could have said, well, you're not going to even follow my people. But God was working on his people to let him, them know he is their God for tomorrow. When he said, you will be leaving the land of Egypt, he said, you will never go back. You won't be captives in this area again. So he had to work on his own people, the Israelite, to show him his power to let them know their trust is in the right person. And you know one thing? God didn't let all the children of Israel go through the Red Sea first, then Pharaoh's army go through. The Bible said in Genesis, Exodus, rather, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 14, look at verse 23 and 24. The Bible says God looked out from that cloud, that same cloud that was leading them. They weren't rushing and pushing over each other as the movie shows. They were going through there in an organized manner. Babies, the cattle, livestock, and all. They weren't rushing. Can you marry carrying your baby or pulling a cart and taking those children? 2.4 million people. Here's another question for you. How long does it take 2.4 million people to go anywhere? That's the power of God. God held up the water long enough for 2.4 million people, not rushing, not running, not pulling, uh, pushing each other down, to walk through there in an orderly manner and allow Pharaoh to come after them before they cross over to the Red Sea. So Pharaoh could think in his mind, I got them. But going back to Exodus chapter 14, 22 through 23, God looked through that cloud. The Bible says in the evening watch, now the evening watch, took some time, some place between 
2 o'clock a.m. in the morning to 6 a.m. in that window of time. Now remember, God told Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt after he killed the firstborn, which was 12 midnight. They're in the Red Sea between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., which is considered the mid-watch. And God began to trouble the chariots and the host of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh then said, God is fighting for them. Now, what did God do? God says, the children of Israel will be saved. Beloved, that is the same God that we serve today. The children of Israel got to the other side, and then the water came back and collapsed. Pharaoh's army were killed. The Bible said that you saw the bodies of the Egyptians floating on the water. They began to praise God sing songs to God to thank him for his majesty and his power. Only the God of heaven could do that. That has never been done in world history, and it has never happened again. But we still honor and serve the same God today. If God can open the Red Sea and let 2.4 million people come through, can he not handle our problems? Can you not trust him? If God can heal his people and tell them how to survive over these challenges, can he not heal your situation, regardless of what it is? As I told the church at Jupiter to question this morning, many people have incurred many challenges in their lives since the pandemic. I told my brothers this, my minister brothers and people in general, as I've talked to when they call each other, when we call each other over the phone, and I made mention of this to the church this morning. And I say this quite emphatically to my preaching brothers that call me and when I'm talking to people in general. God knew there was going to be a pandemic before he even created the world. I want that to sink in. The pandemic did not catch God off by surprise, off God. The Bible tells us quite emphatically in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and following, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and the succeeding verses clearly tell us that God had already planned before the foundations of the world, before he even created the church, before he even created the world, God had already planned to build his church, had already planned for us to be redeemed from the world. And he did that before he even said, let there be light. This pandemic didn't catch God off guard. God, we serve an awesome God. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He is not surprised by anything. And that's why we should pledge our allegiance to the God that could save Moses and all those people because he has not lost any power. He is still omnipotent. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 24, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will lack nothing. God will provide. The psalmist continues in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. He hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. But the psalmist has stopped there. I skip down to my favorite Psalm, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Beloved, ask yourselves, who shall I fear when the Lord holds tomorrow? What shall I fear? Paul says quite emphatically in Romans 8 and verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good. He didn't say everything is good. He said, but everything works together for good to them. Who are the them? that love the Lord. 
And that's why he said in Romans 8 and verse 31 about the power of God in our lives. What's going to separate us from the love of God? Tribulation, distress, challenges in life. What's going to separate us? Paul says, oh, no, none of these things. We are more than conquerors through Christ. Beloved, that's why we need to realize the one who holds tomorrow is our heavenly Father. That's the why we trust in him. That's why we're here tonight, because we pledge our allegiance to him. We are to live for God on a daily basis to show him that we belong to him. That's why Jesus tells us, tells us he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, in Matthew 12, verses 28 and following. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Not maybe, not perhaps. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You can depend on God. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, and that's our Heavenly Father. Put your trust in the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge the Lord. That's why the beloved Apostle Paul says, I know in whom I have believed. I know guess about that. I am persuaded he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And then he said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who supplies my strength. That's why we're here today. We serve an awesome God, beloved. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight and not a member of the body of Christ, you can become a new creation tonight by surrendering your life to him. But you have to have faith in God, not in man. Your faith is misplaced if it is in man. That's why people become frustrated and give up. Keep your eyes on the Lord. The Bible says without faith, Hebrews 11 and 6, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Now notice this. He is a rewarder of them. Who are them? That diligently seek him. You got to have faith in God. Then repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess Christ, Matthew 10, 32, and be baptized to have your sins washed away and become a new creation in Christ. You say, well, Brother Gilmore, I am a Christian, but I have become faint-hearted. I've lost faith in God, and I'm struggling right now. I haven't been meditating on the Word of God. I haven't been praying like I should. I'm spiritually weak. Well, you can come forward and ask for prayers. We can pray for you and pray with you. The prayers of the righteous availeth much. The song of invitation has already been selected. If you have a special need that God can help you with, he can help you with, and he will help you. We have brothers and sisters here that love you and will be able to assist you with your every need. Come give your life to the Lord right now. While together we stand and sing the song of invitation.